Hi guys, Brian from Brian Bowers here. True red tail bows are some of the most expensively priced, but also some of the most variably priced of the locality bows. One question I get a lot is, why is there such a range of prices for true red tail bows? What do the more expensive ones have that the less expensive ones might not have? So today I'm gonna to try to answer those questions. I'm also going to comment on how you can get a top quality true red tail without paying a crazy expensive price, so be sure to stay tuned for that. If you're new to the channel, this is the place for information about all aspects of keeping and breeding boa constrictors in captivity. So if you want to learn all about these amazing animals, be sure to subscribe to the channel. Right now, the range of prices that true red tails are selling for is anywhere from about $300 to about 10 times that much. So I'm going to say a little bit more about why there's such a variability, but first I want to say why are true red tails more expensive than other types of locality boas. And it all comes down to supply and demand, like so many things in economics. So if you have a high demand and a low supply, the prices of something is going to go up. And so true red tail boas have a very low supply and a very high demand. So the supply is low because these animals are not easy to breed. So to get an animal, a breeder to uh, reproductive size, takes a minimum of four years for a male and five years for a female. And many females don't breed until they're about a year or so older than that, which is a pretty good chunk of time for a breeder to invest. It's also quite difficult. True red tail boas are among the most difficult of the locality boas to breed, and there's no assurance of success, even if you've done everything right. So it's not, they're not a formula species. It's not as simple as following a recipe of manipulating the environment a certain way and then you get babies. So what works for one pair of boas or one breeder doesn't work for another one. So it really takes a lot of trial and error just to get things fine tuned before you can breed these animals. So because of the patience and persistence that's required to breed these animals, there's not a whole lot of breeders and the supply of new babies every year stays really small. The demand, on the other hand, is really high because true red tail boas are perceived as being the ultimate boa constrictor. The most muscular, the most beautifully colored, the most impressive, and everybody loves these animals and aspires to have them in their collection. So as long as the demand stays really high and the supply stays really low, I expect the prices will continue to rise. But now why such a huge discrepancy between the lowest price and the highest price? Pretty much any of the true red tails at the lower end of the price range, say under $500, are likely to be wild caught animals. And I want to strongly caution you to avoid wild caught animals at all costs, especially if you're new to the world of true red tail boas. About the only reason why it makes sense to get wild caught animals is for established breeders who want to diversify the genetics of their bloodlines. But often a uh, breeder, if they want to add two additional animals to their collection, they'll buy four or five of the wild caught animals just because they expect a lot of them won't make it. So the wild caught red tails typically have health issues. Often they have parasites, either external or internal. And they often have issues getting established in captivity. They frequently are hard to get feeding and will regurgitate. So it might take several hundred dollars worth of vet bills in order to get an animal going and established in captivity. And then even with the vet, uh, veterinary treatment, it's likely that a lot of these animals won't make it. So I would highly strongly recommend that you avoid trying to buy a wild caught animal in order to save a few hundred dollars off the price of a captive bred animal. There's also something called a farm-raised animal or farm-bred animal, like this Akitos Peruvian uh, true red tail. And this is intermediate between wild-caught and captive-bred. So the animals are bred in a semi-wild environment in their country that they're native to. And then once the females give birth, the babies are uh, exported uh, to other countries. So I acquired this male back in 2017, along with two other farm-raised Akitos Peruvians. And I've actually been quite lucky. These animals have done really well in my collection, and hopefully they should be ready to breed maybe next year. But I've heard that a lot of people that acquired uh, Akitos Peruvians that were farm-bred around the same time, and there, you know, there were a number of shipments a few years ago, a lot of people had issues and the animals didn't make it 
Um, it seems like it was a luck of the draw. If you got animals from one shipment, they were healthy. But if you got animals from another shipment, almost all of them died. So I guess I got lucky, you know, and I really like this male. You can see the beautiful golden colors and I love his blocky peak saddles. Just a really cool look. And I'm looking forward to breeding this guy in a couple of years. But once again, I can't stress how important it is to get a captive bred offspring from a reputable breeder if you want the best chances of, of success with your new true red tail. Wild caught versus captive bred is one reason why the prices vary so much. The next reason has to do with this perception that the quality of true red tail boas varies more than other non true red tail boas. And if you look at prices of a litter, Someone might have 20 babies and they might individually price them based on their perception of the quality of each animal. The prices might go anywhere from $500 to $2,000. So, you know, three of them might be $500, you know, four more might be priced at $750 each, two of them might be $1,000 each, one might be $1,500, and then the ultimate pick of the litter is priced at $2,000, something like that. Personally, I don't think that the quality of true red tails really varies any more than for any other type of locality boa. But I think because they're viewed as the ultimate boa, there's this need for the ultimate example of the ultimate boa. And when we're talking about just a very small increase in quality, the animal can be priced a lot more expensively. And you'll see this with a lot of luxury items from cars to art to antiques to fine wine. I mean, when we're talking about a very small difference in quality, it's a lot more expensive. If you're looking at rare coins, you might be able to get a nice uncirculated silver dollar for a hundred bucks, but then you want one that's just a little bit better, more uncirculated, and it's like $500. So I think the same thing is true with the true red tails. And so I personally don't price my animals uh, individually in a litter. Basically, I have three grades in each litter. I have the hold back quality animals, ones that personally I find really appealing that I want to hold back to continue my breeding efforts. I have the, most of the animals, which are really nice, high quality animals, which I offer for sale. And then once in a while, I'll get an animal that has something wrong with it. It might have a kinked uh, tail or a minor imperfection, and that one's gonna be priced a little bit lower. But amongst the bulk of animals I offer, I offer for sale, I don't individually price them. Basically, I show pictures, I let people decide which ones they want, and the price is all the same. And in fact, in a given litter, animals can have different looks. For example, this is a Suriname male who is very strongly peaked and you know, a very clean background look to him. And here we have another male that looks considerably different, but this male is a full sibling litter mate of the male I just showed you. You can see this guy has round saddles. He's got a more pinkish purplish background color. And I actually held both of these males back from my 2014 litter. That they, they just both really stood out as really nice holdback quality animals that I wanted to use to continue my breeding efforts. But you can see someone might have their own personal opinions and they might prefer either this male or the male I just showed you. And you'll find that animals that have uh, looks that are popular, such as uh, high peaks, high widow's peaks, striping, and uh, very thin saddles, for example. These are things that are popular and people will typically pay extra for these attributes, so they're priced higher. And so I find this kind of foolish. Sometimes when I look at someone who has individually priced boas from the litter, personally, I like some of the less expensive ones better. They just look nicer to me based on my own personal opinion. And then I always try not to look at the price. I look at the boa when I'm deciding if I wanted to add it to my collection. Because when you look at the price, that can have a bias on your uh, opinion of the animal. This guy is not, uh, not an animal that likes to sit still, as you can tell. Um, and then interestingly, what I usually do with my red tail litters, once I have pictures of all the babies, I share them with friends of mine who are boa breeders. And I ask them to individually rate them uh, from one to however many, you know, rank them in order of, you know, the number one boa, the number two boa, etc. And what I find when I do this exercise is that almost all people, myself included, will agree that certain boas are at the top of the list. 
But then we also have a lot of uh, divergence in opinion as far as what the nicest boas are. So really it just comes down to personal opinion uh, as far as which is the nicest boa. And pick the boa you want based on what you think of it. The third reason why a true red tail might be priced more expensively has to do with the reputation of the breeder. Certain breeders have been around longer, they have more of a reputation of delivering quality offspring, and they also put more time into establishing the babies to make sure that they're ready to go. So before you buy your boa, you want to make sure it's established in feeding. You want an animal that's had at least three or four meals and is preferably at least a month and a half to two months old. Some boa breeders will actually hold boas for six months to a year just to make sure that they're ready to go and so they can select the animals that they want to hold back after they've grown up a little bit. But when you get a, when you pay more for a boa from a quality breeder, you're ensuring that your likelihood of success is higher. If anything goes wrong with your boa or you have any questions or issues, a quality breeder will be available to help you out and to solve the problem and get you on the right track. So when you buy a less expensive boa, you might not be getting the same level of service. And if any issues come up with your boa, you might be on your own to solve them. So although it does cost more to go with a reputable breeder, I think this is a good investment and it's well worth it to get your boa from a breeder who has the established reputation. The next reason why one true red tail may be more expensive than another has to do with its bloodline. If it's an animal that has ancestry to a famous bloodline such as Fudo, Florida red tails, or Rio Bravo reptiles, it's going to be valued more highly on the reptile market. A designer bloodline on a true red tail might be in many ways like a designer label on clothing or shoes. While it assures you that you have a better chance of having a high quality item, it doesn't necessarily make it better than an item that doesn't have that designer label. And I think a lot of people get overwhelmingly stuck on you know, the bloodline or the label. They just want something that comes from a famous breeder. But what does a bloodline really mean anyway, and what exactly is a bloodline? So I aim to explore this in an upcoming video, but really to me a bloodline means you can trace the ancestry back to a specific animal. For example, this is my, a boa from my Prometheus bloodline of Suriname red tails. Her father was the famous Prometheus Suriname red tail, so she's from the Prometheus line. However, a lot of people ascribe a bloodline to the breeder's name such as Food Ho Bloodline or, you know, uh, Rio Bravo, Gus Rentfro Bloodline. And while these assure that the animal came from a well-respected breeder, it doesn't really tell you that much about where the animal came from. I mean, these breeders work with multiple bloodlines, so just to call something the Food Ho Bloodline is really a misnomer. The other issue that I have with this is that people are crossing these bloodlines with other bloodlines. So I have a lot of animals in my collection descended from Fudo animals, but none of them is 100% a Fudo bloodline. So what does that really mean? So I think people should be less focused on these designer bloodlines, and they really should look at the animal. If the animal has the beauty and the characteristics that they want in a breeder, then they should go for it. And forget about the bloodline. It really, I've seen a lot of people way overprice or way overpay for an animal based on a bloodline label when I've seen a lot of animals that didn't come from a famous bloodline uh, priced a lot less expensively. One final attribute that can make a true red tail boa command a higher price is a specific locality designation. And what do I mean by this? Well, all locality boas by definition have a locality that they're associated with having originated from or they're descended from ancestry from that given locality. However, some have the locality dialed down to a very precise area. So rather than a Suriname true red tail, we have a true red tail from the village of Pokagran in Suriname. And in some cases, you even have GPS coordinates of the exact locality. So there's this perception that because you have very, very specific locality information, the animal is somehow better or it's you know, more selected or something like that. So these animals will typically command a higher price. However, I really have to be somewhat skeptical of some of these claims because an animal that's from a village that's you know, 10 miles away from Pokagran 
basically looks the same as an animal from Pokergron. And then within the village of Pokergron itself, not all the animals are going to be the same. There's some natural variability. So I'm somewhat skeptical of some of these claims about what does and doesn't constitute a discrete locality of Boa. You know, in my opinion, you need an animal that has some physical characteristics that are different or something that makes it different rather than it just happens to come from the same area. And, you know, I've gone into the, um, my thinking of the Guiana versus Suriname, true red tails, are they different or are they the same? And I've done a video on that, so check that one out if you're interested in more discussion in this area. But what, what I find curious about this whole Pokeron Suriname discussion is that after the original Pokeron red tails came out, largely they were uh, produced by Rio Bravo reptiles, there were a lot of Surinams on the market that claimed to be Pokeron, but they look different. You know, and again, I don't think that all of the boas from Pokeron necessarily look the same. Um, you know, I haven't been to Pokeron, but you know, based on how animals actually look in the wild, I'm going to make that uh, inference. But I think a lot of people just decided to label their animals as Pokeron red tails because it would bring a higher price in the market. And I even saw one breeder claiming he had super Pokeron red tails which is a little crazy because super implies that it's an incomplete dominant morph, like a super jungle. Um, and of course, Suriname is not a morph, so that makes absolutely no sense. But the fact that it's a super Pokemon means it must be all that much more better and more uh, desirable and therefore more high priced. So I would be really skeptical about accepting some of these locality claims as a reason to pay extra for a true red tail boa. The last topic I wanted to cover is how do you get a really high quality true red tail boa without paying a crazy high price. And so hopefully the discussion that I've given will give you some food for thought with what to look for. Um, but you know one thing you may want to look for is a breeder who's not quite as established but you can still know and trust. So frequently breeders who are breeding red tails for the first time or they've only been around a few years, they might not have quite the same reputation or the same fan base as some of the more established breeders, but they are still breeding beautiful uh, animals and they will stand by their animals. So it's a good idea to reach out to these uh, less established breeders, ask them questions about their animals, get a feel for what kind of customer service they offer, and often you can get a really nice high quality boa for you know half the price or less as you would pay for one of the more established breeders. And again, it's not gonna have that fancy bloodline name attached to it, but who knows, maybe 10 years from now, five years from now or whatever, the breeder will be more well established and his bloodline will be, his or her bloodline will be able to establish a higher price on the market because of the reputation he or she has built up. So the other tip I wanna give you is don't look at the prices. So if you have a person that's selling a litter of boas and they've got say 20 boas and they're all individually priced from 500 up to thousands of dollars, cover up the prices, just look at the boa. Decide for yourself which one has the characteristics that you want and which one you value the highest. Don't rely on the boa breeder's opinion. And frequently you'll find that the boa that you like the best is not the one that was the most highly priced. So whenever you see the price ahead of time, it's gonna kind of bias your uh, judgment. But you really wanna not look at the price before you look at the picture of the boa, just to decide for yourself. That was my thinking on why true red tails are priced the way they are, and why there's such variability in the prices of these beautiful animals. I hope this was helpful in giving you some food for thought to consider when you're shopping for your true red tail boa. As always, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to reach out to me via social media. Thanks for watching and enjoy your boas.